Ah, sad dads. We all know one, have one, or heck, some of you might even be one at this point. <laughs> We've all admitted both on social media and to our therapists that the world would be so much better if all dads just expressed their feelings more. Really ask me how my day was instead of saying I lack motor skills for not being able to untie the knot the Chinese food came in. It's not my fault they tied it that tight so the mushu pork wouldn't leak out of the bag, Dad. Why do you have to be so- Circa 2013 and not really stopping until our global pan pizza shifted our monocultural focus to some other thing. Sad Dad Media has had something of a renaissance. These thoughtful, character-driven stories focusing on either a father or father-like figure coming to terms with their place in the world either through interactions with their own child-slash-child surrogate or from the sudden absence of one. Such setup allowed for deeper introspections on masculinity, parenthood, identity, and reconciling with your past shortcomings. It's all good stuff, but like, did we really need this much? You literally clawed Toy Story out of its perfect trilogy just to make Woody a sad dad too. Was it worth it, Disney Pixar? Furthermore, is this even a new concept to begin with? Well, if you go to the Well Actually website, you'll be quick to see that it's been a genre for as long as time itself. The second Alien movie, the B-plot in Jurassic Park, goddamn Lone Wolf and Cub. Upon even the most surface level of googling, you're bound to find something that fits into the sad dad box in one way or another, and I get it. There's a certain appeal to the odd couple nature of a grizzled old man with emotional baggage and the idealized version of a child that totally doesn't represent a chance for redemption and new beginnings. But I'd like to focus on one in particular, from a time when child and parental disconnect was at an all-time high. So to you other kids all across the land, there's no need to argue, parents just don't understand. The late 80s and early 90s gave rise to kid culture in a way not really seen in earlier decades. While there was a clear delineation between children and adults in any time period, this era in particular really leaned into that us versus them mentality. Child gangs serving as a front for the foot Bart mania, the episodes of Tiny Toons where they remember their students. Just a lot of honest kids programming out there as we were slowly transitioning from the 20 minute commercials for toys era. Inversely, I can only imagine the experience as an adult working on these cartoons talking about how adults suck ass. Like, yeah we do, but I can understand how having that mantra blasted into your head at the workplace could lead to some resentment. Like, come on kid, I'm doing my best. And so with this odd, almost paradoxical culture clash of adults creating youth propaganda comes the 90s own emergence of the sad dad genre. But way more radical. Different from modern sad dad media, the sad dads of the late 80s and early 90s were less introspective. Like, we still haven't outgrown the mentality of strength equaling a lack of emotions. I know now why you cry. And more about how the pure intentions of overprotective parenting are bad and can suck actually. The world is changing, and we as parents have this responsibility to protect our children. Now excuse me while I shove you into my car and drive you cross-country to a fishing spot that serves as my parental security blanket. Sure, they eventually learn to accept that time goes on and children will grow up eventually, but that initial poke of a character arc always comes from that very parental impulse of wanting to keep their kids safe at all costs. A Goofy movie is pretty much my gold standard of a well-meaning dad only further distancing himself from his child until character growth must happen, but the one I really want to talk about is the Kessie episode of Winnie the Pooh. Where Goofy Movie really goes out of its way to recontextualize its main characters to the point that it feels wholly disconnected from the TV series it's a spin-off of, the Winnie the Pooh episode Find Her Keeper feels like a more awkward middle ground of sorts. While Goofy serves as a more malleable character to exist in any scenario writers want to throw him in, Rabbit is… not that. It's really weird to think about, but the cast of Winnie the Pooh was a lot more solidified in their characters and personalities than Goofy was in the early 90s. Even weirder when you keep in mind that these are supposed to be stuffed animals coming from a little boy's imagination. Like, I can imagine why a small child would imagine someone like Pooh or Piglet or Tigger or even Eeyore, but Rabbit is such a strange anomaly for the cast. He's essentially the Squidward to Pooh's Spongebob in that he hates fun so much that when fun got stuck in his house, he disguises it with some elk ears and a picture frame. He's a killjoy at every opportunity, but but that's what makes this episode so memorable. We begin the episode with Rabbit berating Pooh, upset that he didn't bring a hot water bottle to help protect the carrot Rabbit is inexplicably trying to grow in the middle of a snowstorm. Like, dang dude, way to set yourself up for failure. 
The snowstorm only gets worse, and the gang discovers a baby bird getting swept by the weather and saves it through a really whimsical flying sequence. The baby bird in question is named Kessie, and oh my god, is she the cutest little cinnamon roll in the world. Like, I get that in a franchise of adorable, literal, plush animal characters, adding one more to the roster feels a bit redundant, but... One, Kessie is an actual bird and not a toy, and two, like, she's got the little dot eyes, dude. I don't know what else to tell you, this is peak cute character design. So the Pooh Patrol volunteers to take care of Cassie as a group, like a more adorable version of Full House, only for Rabbit to immediately shut down the idea entirely. In fact, he's oddly adamant about taking care of Cassie himself, which leads me to question, like, why? Even more so than any of the specials and movies, both before and after it, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh takes an odd amount of interest in digging into just exactly who Rabbit is. Going off memory, there are at least two other episodes really delving into Rabbit as a character, which, real quick, if you want me to delve into either of those episodes, leave a comment or subscribe to my Patreon and bug me there. Thanks. While internet people will be quick to say that Christopher Robin uses his imagination to craft adventures for his toys, the series itself demonstrates multiple times that the lore is more of a proto-Toy Story thing, and the toys themselves are able to walk and talk independently of any child owner. Squonky? 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 I don't carry any. Squonky. As such, we can throw out the possibility that Christopher Robin made each character to fulfill a specific childhood purpose. Doubly so when, if that were the case, he could have just as easily imagined, like, a whole herd of tiggers instead of making him the last of an endangered species. Like, holy crap, what a grim backstory. This is all to say that there really is no in-world explanation for why Rabbit is such a grouch, outside of how, functionally in the story, somebody has to be. He's not exactly the parental stand-in like Kanga, or the source of knowledge like Owl, but for the most part he just serves as a foil for Tigger, who himself is the embodiment of fun. So what happens when you give a character who doesn't really stand for anything, actual responsibility? As we see Rabbit serve as a surrogate father to Cassie, we also begin to see how his meta role in the story as the Killjoy serves as the perfect transition into the thankless parental figure. Sure, he isn't as book smart as Owl or as doting as Kanga, but he has that stern, constantly irate energy about him that the writers could easily use to pivot in any direction with. He's like the queen in chess, or like a ball and socket joint, I don't know. And in such a short amount of time, we see how that personality fits when pitted with a character significantly younger than most of the cast. From the get-go, it's very obvious that Kessie will be serving as the child character to warm Rabbit's cold, cold adult heart. A foil to Rabbit in a way that Tigger could never be. But also, is it fair to say that the role of Kessie herself changes the further into the episode we get? How does the role of a child and parental figure change and grow as the child yearns for independence? Does Rabbit merely serve as Kessie's parental figure, or does it change over time? This episode is formatted interestingly, especially for children's media, in that the story is told over the course of a full year, with major scenes taking place in winter, spring, fall, and the following winter. Each scene more or less reinforces both Rabbit and Kessie's roles in relation to each other, and occasionally how others view said relationship. As Rabbit further cements that it is his mission to take care of Kessie, we see Kessie's own dreams of wanting to fly slowly form. It's a kid's show, they're allowed to lay their themes on a little bit thick. Both character wants are in direct opposition to each other, perfectly teeing up the drama to ensue, and the episode more or less goes on the way you'd predict, with Rabbit learning to let go, allowing Kessie to spread her wings and literally fly away. The two major scenes leading up to this moment, the tree incident in spring and the slingshot incident in fall, functionally serve the same purpose within the episode, and yet are both equally necessary in reinforcing Rabbit's own actions towards Kessie. In spring, Tigger and Kessie hop up a tree which ends up toppling off a cliff. After Kessie is rescued, Rabbit berates her and uses the experience as an excuse for why she shouldn't fly. Likewise, in the fall, Pooh and the gang help Kessie learn to fly with the use of a comically large slingshot, which Rabbit ends up getting yeeted out of. Kessie uses her newly learned flying skills to save him, only for Rabbit to again disapprove of her flying. Lots of falling off cliffs in this episode, being presented as silly as possible to hide the fact that these characters are in actual factual peril. Both scenes, while progressing Kessie's own character, feel very samey when viewed from Rabbit's perspective, and that's intentional. Rabbit fails to save Kessie from the tree, and frames it as a personal shortcoming. We see the same attitude crop up again when Rabbit is flung from the slingshot and has to rely on Kessie to be saved. Rabbit clearly frames himself as Kessie's caretaker, so when he isn't able to take care of not just Kessie, but himself, he feels emasculated and takes these emotions out in the form of forbidding Kessie to fly. 
Rabbit is a character firmly stuck in his own beliefs, incapable of growth or maturity. This is a conflict echoed in modern sad dad media, but in this case we've yet to really progress the conversation past letting the kid go to spread their wings. A lot of the drama in the episode comes from Rabbit's own feelings of inadequacy when he learns that Kessie is growing up. Yet, they're still framed with these empathetic actions, despite how this coddling is clearly preventing Kessie from living up to her potential. There's a lot of, but what about my needs, sympathy that comes from the episode, where no matter how overbearing Rabbit's actions are, nothing is ever outright said about the actions being bad or worse. Toxic. Rather, the episode just concludes that Kessie's own needs must be prioritized first with no real regard about whether Rabbit was justified in his own actions, which is definitely telling of where we were in the pop culture sphere at this time when it came to matters of how one would care for your family. Throughout the episode, Rabbit smothers Kessie with love, and I mean that in the dictionary definition of it. He cares for her so much to the point that Kessie is overcome with it. She can't make her own decisions, and even when she wants to, she's immediately talked out of it because Rabbit knows best. You think I'm not strong enough to handle myself out there. Oh, darling, I know you're not strong enough to handle yourself out there. Of course, the episode eventually lands on Kessie breaking free from this mindset, but we don't get too much time to really sit and think whether or not Rabbit was acting negatively in his own actions. If anything, the end of the episode discusses that Rabbit's own undesirable actions were his form of expressing love, which... Eh. For the longest time, I thought Rabbit didn't like her. You know, Piglet, Sometimes people care too much. I think it's called love. Oh. But then we got a follow-up episode with adult Kessie, and it makes me second-guess being so critical in the first place. The idea of Heffalumps and Woozles being actual nemeses within the poo lore is so weird to me. Here I am trying to bask in the cozy autumn-slash-winter vibes the show has to offer, and the show is just like, but have you considered the possibility that Poo has enemies? As just okay of a follow-up as it is to the previous Kessie episode, though, the episode A Bird in the Hand does offer some well-needed closure when it comes to Rabbit's own actions, finally giving him some accountability and insight on how he actually treated Kessie in the past and how he should move on with a relationship moving forward. The terms parent or even dad are never outright used to compare Rabbit's relation with Kessie, because the end goal was never to frame the two as a parent and child, but as two equals. Once Kessie outsmarts the Heffalump and Woozle and the day is saved, Rabbit acknowledges her as a friend, an equal he can communicate openly and fairly with. And in a time when being a kid is just about the worst thing that can prevent you from being taken seriously, being an equal is a massive honor. What makes today's more modern sad dad media interesting is how it presents this child-parent conflict almost exclusively from the perspective of the father figure. The child character is typically framed as this fresh, innocent start or this long-term fear of taking on traits the father regrets about themselves, and even in the case that the child exists as their own person, they'll usually be shoehorned into one of the first two categories sooner or later. Where the modern sad dad story is about introspection, the sad dad stories of yore focused on the more outward actions in the relationship. Less about the long-term consequences of your actions, and more about the immediate actions you can take now to set them on the right track. If anything, the sad dad media of today is like a direct response to sad dad media made a generation earlier. Conversations with ghosts long past. Immortalized through video and resurrected by the people that cherished it all those years ago. 